I encourage you to look at your own intimacy with God. There is no recipe, but I, I know this. The beautiful privilege we have to sit with God and let Him minister to us is just amazing. He knows exactly what we need, when we need it, but only, only if we're surrendering. If we're not surrendering, God's a gentleman. He's not going to come in there and force you to do something. He'll let you carry on until you say, Lord, I need you. What is it? What inside my heart is ugly? Um, and even realizing that in myself, it's, it's not nice to know there's things in you that are not nice, especially if you don't like rejection. But that's the vulnerability piece. That's the real... Um, it's a real sort of secret spot. So. Good morning uh, to my good friend, Ryan. <laughs> and uh, I just want to say just quickly, um, you know, uh, so Ryan, we, there's lots of things. He's, he's a, a director of a successful company or companies. Um, he's a husband to Nats, and he's a dad to three amazing young men, to Titan, to Kruger, and to Angus. And he's an Australian who was formerly a South African who grew up right here in a Manzum Toti. And um, we all had a moment in our lives where we, we didn't trust Jesus or we didn't think Je it was worth trusting Jesus. And we were good friends growing up together. Neither of us trusted Jesus. And Ryan moved to Australia. I'll just take a liberty to say this, and I don't remember the full story, but he got radically born again, filled with the Spirit of God, and for the last 16 years has been running hard after King Jesus. And every time I speak to him, I am encouraged. I am in awe of his faith and his passion for Jesus and his hunger to be the son that God has created him to be. And it has been such a privilege hanging out with him for a little bit while he's been here. And uh, Ryan, you're an incredible man. And we are privileged today to have you here. I know that you, <laughs> I know, he doesn't like this. I can see it. He's probably thinking, oh, this like, just needs to hurry up. But we honor you for who you are in God, for what you're doing in the kingdom of God. And we celebrate you and thank Jesus that you're here with us this morning. And so won't you come up and join us and won't you give him a, a round of applause. Just welcome him this morning. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure you're marked up and you're good to go. Is that okay? Not yet. Not yet. We'll give you a voice. There's Should one. be right. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Could I pray? Absolutely. Okay? Let's go. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you that there is something so profound and so beautiful, something of you that marks Ryan's life. And it is an indelible mark. It is a mark that has been made by your spirit in him. There is an anointing that he carries. An anointing to see beyond what most people can see into all that you have for us. And I pray this morning, Lord, that something of that, that anointing, that grace is released over this house. Mm. And there would be fresh vision. I pray, Father God, there'd be a, a fresh centering in you that we are sons and daughters a fresh um, sense of identity, purpose, and calling. And so we thank you for the grace, the gift, and the anointing that is upon his life. And I thank you, King Jesus, that you are using him mightily for your glory and his joy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, Wes. Um, I'd like to just start by honoring Wes and Corrine in terms of Pastors carry, I'm glad I'm not a pastor, but they carry a burden, and not a burden that's a, a bad burden, they carry a burden for their church and also their communities, and um, without that, change can't happen, so thank you to Wes and Corinne, and just honour you guys. I'd also like to take the opportunity to, to honour two great men here, Wes and John Arnold, um, as both of them had a, a part to play in my own story of coming to know the <clears throat> the Lord. When I left 16 years ago, I left um, South Africa, went to Australia, um, I walked in no authority, 
I thought I knew what victory was, but it wasn't victory. I was spiritually dead, I didn't know God, and everything was about striving in myself. Um, I come back here, this is the first time I've ever actually preached a Sunday service. I've spoken in a number of sort of business uh, breakfast and the like, but I come back here today knowing the Father is the Redeemer. I walk in his victory and I walk in the identity that he's given me. So I'd also like to pray. So Lord, I thank you for the opportunity today. I thank you for the very place that it is, that it's, it's Wes's church, Lord. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to travel with my son, Titan. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to your hearts. Um, thank you for the ability to encourage. And encourage means to put courage inside. So, Lord, I thank you for the seeds that will be planted um, and the fruit that will come from that. In Jesus' name. I'd like to say that th there is no recipe. So what I'm going to do is share a little bit of my own story about heart transformation and learning to know God as the, the God of victory. Um, but that, you know, I'm not saying that what I do or how I do things is how you should do it. God is amazing. He knows each one of us. He knows our hearts. He knows where we are. Um, so I'll leave that up to you and God and your own intimacy and obedience with God to, to work that out. So for me, identity... Sorry, where's, where's that clicker? Thank you. Will that work? So, it's on. So everything starts with identity, and the reason being for me was, like I said, when I left here, I didn't know my identity. Um, I left after having sold a business here, so I thought that my identity was in success and business and um, what I had is stuff. But that wasn't my true identity. So by the grace of God, I'm, I'm getting to know my identity more. And with that comes not only the identity of me, but my family, uh, my companies, and those around me. So um, I have a beautiful wife, Nats, who grew up in Toddy here as well, and three sons, as we said. And um, we have a family scripture, which is Matthew 5, verse 16. Um, shine your light so others will see the good you do and praise your Father in heaven. Now, when God first gave me that scripture, shine your light so others will see the good you do, it was actually all about that. It was me wanting to look good. Now it's changed. So others will praise your Father in heaven. So it's for the glory of God. So this is... This is part of identity evolving as, you, as I've matured in my relationship with God and getting to know him as the father he is. Um, we also have family values, no different to a business. If we don't have values, how do we make decisions? What's the lens we make decisions from? And we have an identity statement. So I would encourage you to look at your own families, your own self, and say, is there anything you should do in that space? I don't know. That's between you and God. And um, hopefully that encourages you. So... If everyone, I'm going to ask a question. I love questions. I've, I've learned to ask myself questions. So I'd like you to take a moment. Don't, don't shout out to anyone else. But um, the first thing that comes to your mind about what, is, what does victory look like to you, just take a moment and think about that. So there's a reason I ask this because there's two pivotal moments in my journey that were <clears throat> based on two things. One was reading Exodus chapter 17 and the other one was being asked that same question by somebody. And I'll share some more a little bit later about that. But when I so became a Christian... And I was doing all the right things. So until about six years or so, I was in the church. I was actually on the church board. I had businesses. I had um, 
um, chairman of the board of a fatherhood foundation, which is a thing all about fathering. Um, anyway, giving lots of money away and really just patting myself on the back. And um, it only came at a point where there was a point of surrender in my life, which was true surrender. So the other points were, yes, I was on a journey with God and you know, God's word was entering my heart and all those sorts of things, but it was still, it was still actually all about me. And about six, six, seven years ago, there came a point in my life where my wife Nats came to me and she said, that's it, I'm out of here, me and the boys are gone. So on the outside, everything looks great, you know, doing all these things, but inside of my own home, there's arguing, there's you know, lack of connection, there's me putting task over a relationship. And um, it was all because inside of me, there was this, this brokenness, this, this unfilled hole that I didn't even know existed. So until I got to a point of really surrendering and taking that to God to show him, to say, hey God, this is, this is what I see in myself, um, was it then when it started changing? So and I, reading Exodus 17, I look at Moses. So Moses, the very first thing he tried to do was in his own strength and he ended up killing a, um, you know, one of the Egyptians. But later on, fast forward till the end and what's happening? He's not doing it himself. He's not even fighting the battle. He's praying and God is using Joshua to fight the battle. So this is part of the journey of co-laboring and learning what it is I should be doing, what is it I need to surrender and um, what is it in myself that I need to see to change. So move on to the next slide. And another question. Are you being honest with yourself? Do you know how to be honest with yourself? I certainly didn't. It took me many, many years to learn how to be honest with myself, to learn actually what is my true motivation for things. And I'll, I'll share a quick story. There was... Um, when we would go out for, you know, with people to restaurants or to friends' houses or whatever, I would become an ultra-disciplinarian. So I grew up in a military sort of home. My mom and my dad were both from military backgrounds. And, you know, for me it was, you know, it was a very, you know, everything was very disciplined. And what I realised going out, and Todd, and, you know, probably won't want to remember, but does remember, I'm sure, going out and I would absolutely be a disciplinarian, particularly if I'm in the shops anywhere, until I asked myself why. And the real reason was pride. I wanted to be seen as a good father. And what I was doing was actually putting that above my relationship with my sons. And you know, for me to be honest with myself, I had to see what is the real motivation? What do I re why am I really doing that? Because if I can't answer that question, how can, I, how can I take God's word and truth and put it into my heart to displace the lie? And so fast forward, how did I learn to become honest with myself? And I had a, got a really good mentor and he encouraged me to have a, what he calls a pray day. So he's a very successful uh, businessman and, and I could not see how I could ever take a day off every week um, to spend time with God. But anyway, I find obedience quite easy so I thought, uh, you know, it's working for him, let me give it a try. Again, my motivation was because I saw him as successful in business and I wanted to be successful in business. So again, I only realised that later what was my real motivation. But anyway, this is through the grace and mercy of God, spending time with them and then, you know, like Proverbs says, if you're going to meet someone important, take the most valuable thing you have. Well, the most valuable thing we have is our heart. Just like Wes said, you know, he doesn't want your money, he wants your heart. So I was doing pray days, spending time with God, journaling, all those sorts of things. But what I, what I actually realised by being, learning to be honest with myself was I was almost seeing God as a vending machine. <laughs> so I'm here, I'm having a pray day, patting myself on the bat. Yeah, it's the right thing to do, very task orientated. And I'm asking God just about how do I do this better? How, you know, how do I, you know, a bit more efficient in my in my business? How to? And yes, I was getting answers. Make no mistake. But fast forward that to where I am now, and my favourite day of the week is my prayer day, 
It is just an amazing time that I spend with God. And I get to hang out some. Sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's four hours, sometimes it's three hours. And it is just beautiful. And that is where I take all those deep vulnerabilities in my heart and I expose them to him and I say, Lord, help me. And why I share this, it has been so pivotal in my journey. Holy Spirit reminded me of a time. So I never saw the lens of acceptance. I never saw that I did everything out of this lens of feeling more accepted. But Holy Spirit reminded me of a time when I was about two years old and my folks were in Rhodesia at the time. My old man was off firing the bush war. And, um, and we're not supposed to have memories at that age. But I vividly remembered my mom taking me and saying to the maid, take him away before I kill him. Now, my mom had two children. Who knows what I was doing? I don't know. Obviously, that wasn't what my mom really said or meant. But at that moment, I took that word, I put it in my heart, and I decided I was un unaccepted rejected. So now fast forward through my whole life and I'm wearing a set of lenses of I need to be feeling accepted. So without knowing God, what did that look like? It looked like sport was very important, school. I can remember the first, my dad never played sport with me, but he taught me how to fight. And um, I remember at school the very first fight I had and I thumped that kid. And um, what happened was all the boys around me, oh, yeah, and guess what? That felt nice. Yeah. It made me feel accepted. So what did that do? Sort of this thing inside of me becoming very, I need to be tough. I need to, you know, if anyone gives me trouble, I need to headbutt them or whatever else it is. And um, so all these things come in my life and it's this whole thing of acceptance. And without realizing what the real reason is, I could never replace it with the truth which means that lie manifests in my heart and I live my life from that place. So this beautiful time of intimacy with, with God um, just allowed him to minister to me in a different way, um, which means now, hence the start with identity, repenting, first of all, repenting, saying, Lord, I'm sorry that I've taken this need for acceptance, taken on me and said, hey, I know how I'm going to fix this. Through having stuff, being seen as tough, seen as successful, all these things, but actually never filling it and chasing a lie that actually then impacts all those around me in a negative way, including my wife, my sons, the people in my businesses, and um, yeah, living through a lens without victory, living from a place of finite. It's all about me, what I can do, what I can I achieve, how hard can I work. Um, and, and look, Again, I was doing well in business, everything else, but I reached a point where I couldn't do any more, really. Ticking all the boxes, but still things were not right. And the reason being, because in my deep heart, there was this, this lie, this deception, this distortion. So, I encourage you to look at your own intimacy with God. There is no recipe, but I, I know this the beautiful privilege we have to sit with God and let him minister to us is just amazing. He knows exactly what we need, when we need it, but only, only if we're surrendering. If we're not surrendering, God's a gentleman. He's not going to come in there and force you to do something. He'll let you carry on until you say, Lord, I need you. What, is it? what inside my heart is ugly? Um, and even realizing that in myself, it's, it's not nice to know there's things in you that are not nice, especially if you don't like rejection. But that's the vulnerability piece. Yeah. That's the real, um, that's a real sort of secret spot. So my wife, Nats, she's an amazing woman and she's, she's, written a, she's actually written a book. She's, and part of my learning how to do the heart journey comes from my wife. Um, she had quite significant trauma in a um, dysfunctional family and she really made a, a process or a stepwise of dealing with the heart issues. So I've taken that together with Pray Day and, and this is how I've learned to, to, you know, to move with God and let him to minister to me. So I 
I, I, I thought of an analogy. And I've, that word trust, so Romans 4, verse 16, everything depends on having faith. Whenever I read the Bible, I change the word faith to trust because faith feels a little opaque to me. I, whereas trust, I can understand trust. I can, I can know there's no halfway. You're either in fear or you're in faith. You're either in fear or you're in trust. So for me, it, it's a very... It makes it very easy for me to know, is, am I in fear or am I in trust? And the only way I can know that is by being, again, being honest with myself and knowing what is my real motivation for what I'm feeling, what I'm speaking, what I'm doing. So and while I was sort of spending some time with God, he gave me this analogy of you know, a car being realigned. So to have a car to be realigned, there can be a... I have noticed a few more potholes since I've come back but a lot of other positive stuff. But think of that, realignment in your vehicle, just a little bit, just a little distortion. If you don't recognize it, if you don't deal with it, there's a number of things that happen. Your speed, when you get over a certain speed, it starts to shudder, which guess what, you slow down. So unless you take that vehicle to the mechanic, you surrender the time, you surrender the, the actual work where they physically got to change something in you, you will remain distorted. You will remain off course. And here's the thing. Most of us don't recognize it when we're off course because it's in our blind spot. Because it's the very thing in our heart we're trying to protect ourselves from. So my question to you is, are you prepared to take the time, the effort, to go and get reliant? And that is up to you. And what that looks like to you is up to you and God. I'm going to share a quick story and God is just amazing in how things continue to mature with, with him and um, I was on one of my pray days in the, about six months ago and um, I really had been learning how to be sensitive to hearing Holy Spirit in all little things whether it's walking past a cupboard and seeing a, something in the cupboard and then my wife phoned me later that day, and you know, fortunately I do most of the dishwasher in our house. <laughs> and I opened the cupboard door and saw this, you know, certain concentrate. And I think, well, why did that jump out at me? Anyway, later in the day, my wife phones me. And says, oh, you know, dramatizing things a little bit, but <laughs> the dog's brought in a rotten egg and it's chewed it on the carpet, and the whole house stinks. I can't, you know. I said, well, just use that concentrate. So Holy Spirit had shown me already that that was going to need to be used that day. So over my time, I'm learning to hear and listen to Holy Spirit for all the little things, and it's amazing. But anyway, so I'm on my prayer day, and it was raining, and there were some significant storm clouds. And um, I felt like God said, get out, let's go for a walk. So yeah, okay. And um, you know, look at the clouds. I felt like he said to me, trust me. All right. So I get out the car and I think of the umbrella in the back. But no, then I thought, no, God told me to trust him. So anyway, I start walking. I walk half an hour and guess what happens? Absolutely starts pouring with rain. So now I run back to the car, take a jog. It takes me about 10 minutes to get back to the car. I get in and literally my shoes were filled with water. And I sit in the car and I say, God, what was that? What happened there? You told me to trust you. And he said, but I told you there was an umbrella in the back. Yeah. <laughs> so, and why do I share that story? Because I put an expectation that God had said to me it wouldn't rain. He didn't say it wouldn't rain. He said to me, trust me. And this is the, and showed me the umbrella, and this is the co laboring. So, this is how I'm learning to make decisions, whether it's with my family, whether it's in business, and it's this co laboring, this, you know, I was just talking to Vessel at the door there, this unfair advantage. We have Holy Spirit, but we also have a choice whether we use it or not. I know this, I like using it because it, 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 it's a lot more fun. And the results are good. But saying that, 
I wish I could fast forward to the part now of co-laboring where I am and I'm learning and continuing to mature, but the reality is without having done the heart journey first and number of years without seeing any physical change, I, I couldn't be doing what I'm doing now. So don't be discouraged that it might take time. It takes courage, it takes persistence, it takes intention. Another story, just haircuts. And, I, and, and why I want to share this story is because for me it just shows how God is the Redeemer and He's changing things in, in me and my family. Um, my middle son Kruger, who's 14, Look, he's, he's super strong, he's really, really, he does a lot of gym. Anyway, he's actually being really bullied at the school he was at. And um, so he comes and he tells me this, well, first it, rep, you know, it manifested in anger. And I said, and what's really going on? And he tells me this. And straight away I want to step into my old identity, put on a balaclava and say, come, let's go, we'll find that boy and his father and we'll, we'll do what we've got to do. <laughs> but obviously now we've matured and God's helped me. So anyway, so he's, he's going through this, he's navigating this. And um, why have I got haircuts up there? In Australia, unfortunately, having really messy hair is what's fashionable. And as a father that really struggles, you know, I don't have to worry about that, but... And I grew up in a home where everything had to be aligned and everything. Anyway, it's a bit of a struggle. So I've been on and on and on at Kruger about having a haircut. And I'm, and I'm on him. Kruger, we're going to take you to have a haircut. Kruger, when are you getting a haircut? Anyway, we get in the car one morning and I'm on him, on him about having a haircut. And he's angry and he's you know, just responding. And I, anyway, I look in the, I look in the back and his chin is quivering. So, why do I share this story? Because through me going on a hard journey and learning to be honest with myself, we're actually teaching our sons how to do the same. So I said to him, Kruger, what's up? How are you really feeling? And he said to me, Dad, I feel like I'm not good enough because you keep on telling me to have a haircut. So what I realized at that moment was it was actually fear that had crept into me because I didn't want my son to be rejected at school and had this ridiculous mindset and I'm judging his hair and this comes from my family of origin that everything has to be right to be accepted. His hair's got nothing to do whether he's accepted or not. But this fear creeps in, distorts puts me into fixed Fred mode where I believe there's a problem I need to fix it instead of taking it to God. But here's the Redeemer. He says that to me. I catch it now and I say, why is this so important to me? And that's you know, why I'm still driving. Oh, it's fear, it's judgment. Kruger, I'm really sorry, boy. It's actually fear and I don't want you to be feeling rejected. And that just brings an amazing opportunity for relationship because he suddenly doesn't feel that he's not good enough. He understands where it comes from, which means he can process that. It doesn't impact his heart negatively, and then we pray together. So this now becomes victory. So something that the enemy wants to take and distort now becomes victory in our, in our vehicle as we're driving him to the station. So this is how learning to be honest and having this intimacy with God is changing my life and learning and helping me to partner with God. So I think we're about to land this now, so um, back to my question about what does victory look like to you. So I was asked this question and straight away out my mouth came living a life from a soft heart. And I knew it wasn't me speaking that, it was the Holy Spirit telling me. So. To live from a place of a soft heart means I have to be vulnerable and it, ha it means I have to trust the Lord. I have to trust the Lord with the things that are the most scariest to me, the things that are the deepest to me, the things that I don't even know are there and trust Holy Spirit, He'll reveal them to me. And what I'm learning is that trust is the doorway to victory. 
anything in my life that has a limit on it or is not where I want it to be, I now ask myself, what is my trust in? Is it myself? Is it a business? Is it another person? What is it? What if I have allegiance with? Because if it's not God's word, and if it's not his truth or his promise, there's a distortion, which means I will not walk in victory in that space. So I have a couple of points and then wrap it up. 1 John 5 verse 4 says, Every child of God can defeat the world. And our faith is what gives us this victory. Our faith or our trust gives us this victory. And defeating the world means defeating those lies that come for our heart, for our beliefs, for our, for our lens that we make decisions through. So some encouragements for myself that I've jotted down and processed over time. Don't doubt or, got, or question God's promises. Don't allow unbelief to take hold. Choose childlike faith. Victory is for me. It's not a recipe. And it's his choice for me. True freedom and victory first start with our heart beliefs. A question I ask myself often is, do I want to live in amazement and miracles? Or do I want to live in a finite world? And that finite world is, is often restricted by my need to understand. I don't need to understand anymore. If God says do something, even if it sounds ridiculous, I can choose to do it and trust him. And then watch what he does. Um, another point is when God gives me a dream or a vision, and as I learn to trust God more, it's like this bandwidth inside of me is changing for dreaming, for vision, for thinking of things that are possible. Because if I'm just thinking about all these lies and living through these lenses, my ability to dream just gets absolutely turned down. So my question to you is, what does that victory look like? What is that dream? I didn't know how to dream. I'd forgotten to dream. He created each one of us with a unique dream. And for us to be who he made us to be and do what he made us to do takes us to surrender our heart. And be intimate and obedient with him. So what is that dream? And what is the promise you're standing on? So if you walk into my bathroom, the boys' bathrooms at home, all over the mirror and the tiles are written promises. His word, his truth. Every morning, first thing you see. Every night, the last thing you see. And over time, planting a seed in your heart, suddenly it changes. And that's how we start walking in victory. So, two questions, some more questions. What do you think intimacy will unlock in your own life and the lives of those around you? And again, will you decide to change anything or do anything differently today? Not tomorrow, today. Yeah. That's your choice. That's Finally, this is my, uh, something I try and end off on every single email that I, I send that where these, these believers is continue to walk in his victory. Because I know and I picture what a world looks like when everyone's walking in his victory. And it is amazing. It's incredible. It's exciting. It's fun. So I bless you guys. And I really encourage you to step into his victory and living in intimacy and obedience with God. Don't, don't go anywhere. Just stay for a second. Okay, so I want Ryan just to stay for a moment because I want him to pray for, for some of us today. So part of Ryan's story that he's not going to tell you is that he is an incredibly successful businessman. He, was telling, he started off with a vision of $60 million. He's surpassed that. Eh? There's a bigger vision going on at the moment. He's involved in a massive operation in the Middle East. So yeah. half a trillion dollar 
building project. Hey? 500 billion. 500 billion. Yeah, well, it sounds better to say half a trillion. <laughs> yeah. So he's an incredibly, incredibly successful businessman. He's wealthy by world standards. And, and the thing that doesn't make sense is that he should take a day off in his busy week or hours off in his busy week to be with Jesus. Yeah. Mm. And if you had the opportunity to spend a little bit more time with Ryan, what you would figure out is that in those moments when he's been with Jesus, God has unlocked success for his business and success for his family and for mm. his life. But his story is not about the success of business. This, his story is the success of a heart that has been unlocked. Mm. And a heart that is fully surrendered and devoted to Jesus. A heart that is living fully alive to God. The thing that I love about Ryan so much is because he is a very real person. He's not a pastor. He's not a preacher. It's not his, his, his day job. Praise the Lord <laughs> for him. <laughs> Otherwise you'd be like me, pal. You know? but, but, he is, but he is serving Jesus faithfully yeah. every day in a way that when I listened to him on Friday morning, I was like, Wes, you need to spend more time with Jesus. Yeah. You need to be more intentional about what God is wanting to do in and through you in this house and in your life. He's like a businessman. He's probably too busy to spend, to spend hours a day praying with the Lord once a week to, to remind a pastor of that. Mm. That's because of the heart journey. That's because he's gotten real with God. He's gotten real with God about where he is and what he's doing and what God's doing in his life. And he's vulnerable to say, I made a mess of it with my boyki. And then mm. we sorted it out. And the reality is that unless we are willing to be honest, yeah. that question that he said, are you, are, are you being honest with yourself? Are you really being honest with where you are with God and what's going on in your life? You see, the reality is, is we're hiding all the time because we think God wants to get us. Mm. Or he's going to embarrass us. Or he's going to you know, stick us on the mountains up and look, and look at this guy. You know, look at too. Don't be like him. That's never God's intention. God's intention is to shelter you in his presence so that you abide in his love so that you get to dwell in his goodness. Mm. And you get to work that out in your life. And what I just have a sense to you, because Ryan is very early. For, we only go home late often. I'm just teasing. No, this is what I felt. Is I want to ask that those of us that are here today that are saying, you know what, Ryan? I want to go on that heart journey. I want to be real and open and honest with where I am and what I'm going with. There are people in this room today, you are failing. And you're failing by the standard that you made for yourself. Mm. And so you're living miserable and you're living frustrated and you're living angry and you're living upset with God. And God's saying, but I didn't call you to that. I didn't put those standards there for your life. You need to get alone with me and trust me again because I have something. And if I ask Ron this question, Ron, is your life good? Absolutely, love it. Are you having fun? Yes, and more and more. Yeah. From before where everything was a burden in terms of now where, like I said, I had forgotten how to dream. Versus now, it's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're living a good life. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know why? Because he's put Jesus first. You see, God's not looking for perfect Christians. Mm. He's looking for surrendered Christians. Yeah, he's amen. looking for men and women who will lay down their own agendas, their own things, and say, King Jesus, what do you want for my life? Mm. And I promise you now what will happen is in obeying him and surrendering him, you will find yourself living the best life you could ever imagine. Mm. Like, what happened? And so I know he's not a, a preacher. I know he doesn't spend his days writing prayers. But Ryan, I want to ask mm. those of you that are serious about going on a heart journey today. And again, you don't have to stand. You, you, there's no pressure to you. But you're saying, King Jesus, I want to be more intimate with you. I want to spend more time with you so that I might know your heart and live in what you have for me. Yeah. If that's you, I want you to stand. I'm going to ask Ryan just to pray over us. That's it. He's going to pray a simple prayer over us. I'm not putting you on the spot, so I'm I'm sorry. Right. But I want him just to pray over us. And then you're going to go home, and we're going to trust the king that you are going to begin to live in the power of that reality, mm. the wonder of a fresh journey with him so that we can live in all that he has for us. And so if that's you this morning, I'm going to go back down there because I want to stand. <laughs> and I want Ryan to pray over me this morning. <laughs> and so that's okay. I'm going to leave Absolutely. you all by yourself again. And then, then I'll come back and I'll send you home. But if that's you this morning, won't you stand? And Ram, would you pray over mm, us? Absolutely. I'd love to. 
So Lord, I, I thank you that each person, as they stood, that is a, a physical declaration. It's actually a decision for you, Lord, a decision to to step into something that it, that might be scary, Lord. But as we prayed in the start, Lord, that, that sees a courage would be placed in our hearts, Lord. So thank you for every person here. Thank you for the plans you have for them that are good. Thank you for a good Father, Lord. Thank you that you are, you are your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, you know exactly what it is that we need to do. Thank you as we come to you, Lord. You already know it, but thank you you just reveal it to us. And thank you, Lord, you don't just reveal it to us, but that we choose to replace those lies, those distortions with your truth, your word. And thank you what that looks like in our lives, Lord, and not only for us, but for those around us, Lord. Thank you that it changes not only our own hearts, but the hearts of our families, the hearts of our communities, our businesses, and all those around us. Thank you, Lord, with that. We get to live in your infinite victory, Lord. Bless everyone, Lord. Bless their families. Amen. Awesome. Ryan, thank you. I appreciate it. You're sitting down? Are we doing another round or are you going home? <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But Ryan, thank you so much. Titan, thank you for being with us this morning. We appreciate you. I know you, you're on a, a wonderful holiday with your dad too, and you had to come to church this morning, but I know you love Jesus too, so it's amazing. But thank you for being with us. Family, we love you. If you need prayer for anything, we'd love to pray with you. But otherwise, have a wonderful, God-filled rest of the week. Be blessed. And if you have the time and you want to be with us tonight, there's an evening service. But have a wonderful, God-filled week. We bless you. We love you guys. Cheers.